Nigel Collins linger from James Brown. Brown. From James so here we are. And he was also a very nice man. I had the pleasure of meeting him back in the middle of the so right, he, 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 he did. He lived in Milton and he sadly died over here he in Milton as well. And, um, and he was also uh, a very nice man. I had the pleasure of meeting his brother earlier on this year, Angelo. He lived in Nottingham and he sadly died over here in Nottingham as well. And he was a lovely man. I had the pleasure of also meeting his brother earlier on this year, Angelo. I also had the and pleasure of meeting Benny King um, and also seeing him. I saw him on about, the last time he was over here, which was about five years ago. That's played time and time again, isn't it? Meeting up with him. I also had the pleasure of meeting Benny King and also seeing him. I saw him still, about, I think it was the last time he was over here, which was about five or six years ago. That must have been really great. Had the great pleasure of meeting up with him and also going to see him perform. And he's still, he was still a great performer. I mean, that must have been really great working with those sort of people. Well, I mean, at the time, it's mind boggling. And then these are people that. like a kid in a sweet shop. Do you actually play yourself on uh, Do You Know It's Christmas? Uh, No, I didn't. Uh, But that was done. Uh, Mitch, you put that all together, and I think it was uh, Phil Collins and uh, quite a stellar lineup. I mean, I wasn't. It just came out. The Rats had stopped working, and Geldof did that during an off period. I had booked a tour, and by the time the Band Aid single came out, we went on tour, so we had to learn to play it. So we were the first band ever to play it live. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, you work with Dexy's Midnight Runners as well. Yeah. Um, when they released the uh, Come On Eileen single during the sort of Irish tramp image <laughs> yeah. period, um, uh, they were looking for some new horn players and we got dragged in and that and did the uh, no. world tour. It was number one in America and we toured America that time. Huge, wasn't it? It was a huge... Did you actually... Were you actually in the studio and they recorded it? You didn't... 
No, no. because um, they'd already recorded it and released it. And they needed a band to, to go on the road with. Go on the road, and they'd only ha- and they only had a couple of fiddle players. Um, okay, because I'd heard I'd heard a story, and I don't know how true it is. And I was hoping you would be able to confirm it. It's a, you know, it gets faster and faster at the end. Yeah, they were running out of studio time. Is what I'd heard. <laughs> I love the I love the idea of that. I don't know if that I, that was that was the story I'd heard, and I thought, oh, perhaps you'll be able to confirm this, or do you? No, I can't confirm it, and I think it's a bit unlikely. It sounds really. unlikely, I mean, doesn't it? But uh, that's a story I'd heard. Then you yeah, worked with well, Thomas. I mean, there's a lot of stories, aren't there? Oh no! Then you worked with Thomas Dolby as well, didn't you? And uh, Haircut 100 as well. Well, Haircut 100 that was uh, that was a bit of a shame, really, because um, I liked working with them. But we got called in to play on their very final uh, tour when they were breaking up, when Nick Haywood had had enough, mm. and um, and because they were sort of um, such a teeny bop band in a way, but although musically they were much better than than that, um, they, they sort of had the screamers, um, <laughs> kids uh, for yeah. their for their audience, and I think Nick Hayward wanted to be uh, consider himself uh, a more serious artist than that. Mm. And then you work, went and worked with Duran Duran. Duran Duran, yeah, that's again through the Visconti's um, mm. uh, connection because a couple of the guys that worked in his studio, uh, like Colin Thurston. Um, produced Duran's first single, which was called Planet Earth. Mm-hmm. And uh, they wanted a horn section to play on the 12 inch version, and that was our connection. And mm-hmm. we worked with them, I worked with them on and off for about 10 years. <laughs> Could you be my baby? 
Had it to the great mind, not much longer would you be my baby. Ah, 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 Nicky Nocky, no. Had it to the great mind, not much longer would you be my baby. Ooh. Woke up and the toilet was overflowing. Must call the plumber. Realised the kids needed swimming lessons as it's all got out of control. Luckily the old windows gave out so we all floated outside. Must get onto the glazers. And now the garden looks atrocious. Now what was the number for that landscaper? Because you never know when a potential customer needs you, get yourself listed in your local flyer, the local business directory. Your local flyer, bringing businesses to your fingertips. There we are, that's Spike's all-star band and their version of Heard It Through the Grapevine, featuring the vocals of the great Madeline Bell. Uh, you're listening to the Sticks Radio Show here on Seclo Sounds. And let's rejoin Mr. Spike Edney. Then you join a, a sort of shabby band that nobody's heard of called Queen. Yeah. How did how did that come about? Uh, that was kind of been been in the right place at the right time. Um, I got a gig playing the piano in a West End bar pub that became quite notorious called Stringfellows. Um, but it opened in the early eighties, and I was the resident piano player there for a while. And all sorts of people used to come in there. And um, a guy came in who I'd not seen for a long time, um, who'd been around as a, a crew guy in the seventies, and he said, "Oh, I'm working for Queen. They need." Uh, uh, they want to take an extra person, a piano player on the road, keyboard player, synth player, um, on their next tour. Are you up for it? And I said, yeah, of course. You know, you just say yes to everything. You don't really think anything's going to happen. And then lo and behold, six months later, he, he got in touch with me and said, oh, come over to the office and say hello. So I went over to the office thinking, well, this is going to be me and 800 other people um, lining up for this gig. And I was the only one there. And uh, wow. had a quick chat to their tour manager, and he said, okay, you fly um, to Munich. Uh, next Monday and I said but I haven't met them what happened is they said they don't like me he said well then on Tuesday you'll fly back <laughs> and they obviously didn't like you've been working with them for 30 years it kind of worked out yeah I think it must have done I mean you, you've, you've played on some of the classic you, I mean you played on Live Aid with them Rock at Rio Live at Wembley and you played at Nebworth which was 1986 if I remember correctly yeah, August 1986. I, I, we did didn't it? know it, but that was the final proper I, Queen show, the final one that Freddie would do, um, because uh, after that he started to uh, not feel well, mm. and as we all know, uh, tragically died in 91, so mm. never got to do any more touring. I think there were a couple of more appearances that he made with the band, one-offs, but there was no more touring. Mm, that was the 9th of August 1986. Was it really? I'll tell you how I know that. It was the day I got married, and... I originally looked at Nebworth Barnes, which is the, the function suite in Nebworth, in, oh. in Nebworth House, and when I went to book it, somebody else had booked in before me, and it would have been classic that day, watching Queen and having a wedding at the, a wedding reception at the same time. Oh, yeah, that would have been classic, you're so, right. Some, that's how I remember it very, very well, and it's, it's great. And I mean, you've been, with, um, you've been with the band ever since, basically, haven't you? Well, um, they dragged me in to do either live performances or when they're doing something like the Nelson Mandela shows or... Uh, or, or award ceremonies or something. Anywhere that involves playing live, I'm normally involved. Because mm. you obviously they just they they lost Freddie and then they found another guy called Paul Rogers who was with you for a few years, about three or four years. Yeah, well, Paul Rogers, of course, is one of the greatest uh, blues rock singers this country's ever performed, and he uh, was the lead singer of a band called Free, who were mm-hmm. iconic in the '60s, and whom Queen admired and looked up to when they started even though the blues thing wasn't really uh, Freddie's style. He loved and he personally um, admired Paul Rogers, and we all do. And um, it was uh, at a sort of Hall of Fame performance in 2004, I think it was, where um, Paul Rogers was singing and didn't have a band, and Queen were playing and didn't have a singer. Mm. So as a matter of convenience... um, uh, we played All Right Now for Paul Rogers, and he sang We Are the Champions for Queen. Yeah. And thus the uh, alliance was born, and that did two world tours and an album as well. Yeah, the Cosmic Rocks, I've got it. It's, Cosmos Rocks, I've got it. It's an amazing album. Yeah, it's a great album. I mean, a lot of people sort of uh, poo-pooed it because the old Queen album without Freddie doesn't really count, but I thought there's some great stuff on oh, there. Some great and he's, it. he is a great, and still is a great singer for yeah. it. And of course, now you've got Adam Lambert with you. Adam Lambert, a young, charismatic... Oh. He's. Uh, have you seen him perform live? Yet? I saw New Year's Eve. Right, well, he has 
charisma and vocal ability in in bucket loads, and um, he's a great, great singer. I mean, there are not many people who can sing these songs, but um, Adam is one of the few, along with Paul, 